much of the research and training that doctors receive on women's health is actually quite outdated. Living every day in pain or in, or in struggle. Women are so mysterious in a beautiful way. We carry so much intuitive wisdom. I could cry at like any moment and I could have a breakdown and I wouldn't know why. Very emotional, it was affecting my relationship. I was just literally begging them I can't live like this. I, I all knew something was wrong with your bodies, but you weren't being listened to. My, I think my life changed when I started having the symptoms and my life changed even more when I found out what it was. Welcome to The She Word, where we have conversations that women rarely have but really should. My name is Sasha. I am your host for this edition, the Young Women's Edition, where we are having conversations which are more tailored towards a younger demographic of women. I'd like to remind you to follow and subscribe to our channels. You can follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, LinkedIn, and you can also subscribe to our Patreon page, where 50% of our proceedings go towards the Richmond Foundation, who are offering free therapy for women who, who are not able to access it. Today's show is Young Women and Health, and I am so pleased to have included two shows touching upon women's health on season two of this edition. To continue raising awareness about experiences which tend to be more common than we imagine them to be, but are not quite spoken about. Being a woman who has personally experienced misdiagnosis, prolonged diagnosis and very invasive interventions at quite a young age, it's yet another topic which is immensely personal to me and very close to my heart. The Women and Women's Health episode of season two of the main show of The She Word was actually my first introduction to this podcast, as a, having first appeared as a guest um, on the show to speak about my experience with ovarian cysts and its removal and also having my ovary removed at just 19 years of age. Fast forward to now, I'm so lucky to be hosting season two of my show and discussing the same exact topic with three amazing women. So without further ado, I'm joined here today by three ladies who have all had their own experiences with health challenges, with some of these challenges only impacting women. We've got Megan May Caruana, who is a 20 year old <laughs> singer, songwriter, music student, and also a vocal coach, and has been living with fibromyalgia. Hello, Megan. Hello, Sasha. How are you? I'm okay. How are you Great. feeling? I'm really excited. Me too. Really excited. <laughs> Me too. I think that is going to be such an amazing conversation, especially for women out there, and also for ourselves, you know, to actually get the space to talk about these things. So thank you Absolutely. all. Thank Anna you. Tortel, Hello. who is a 22-year-old journalist and recent university graduate, yeah. who's got her own experiences related with PCOS and endometriosis. Hello, Anna. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome. I'm very excited. Me too. <laughs> and finally, Tara Bayer, the wise words for our show today. <laughs> no pressure. pressure. <laughs> <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> She's a 29-year-old health specialist, um, somatic alignment practitioner, specializing in toxicity cleanses, hormones, and also autoimmune, and who has also faced autoimmune diagnosis and many other diagnoses in her past. <laughs> Hello, Tara. Hello. Hello. How are you feeling? I'm, I'm very good. Thank you so much for having me here. And I'm really excited to connect with each and every one of you and to take this out for everyone else. Me so. too. Me too. So ladies, thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Um, it won't be an easy conversation, of course, because it's very personal, but yeah. I'm, I'm already filled with a lot of hope for where this is going to go <laughs> and how many women it's actually going to touch and help. I want you all to take a bit of a moment to introduce yourselves now. I've introduced you, but maybe you want to say something, why you're here today, why you felt called to come on this podcast. Go for it. Anna? Sure. Um, so I'm... Um... A journalist I'm 22 um I also have IBS as well as, PC as well as PCOS and endometriosis and from my experience and my experience is very recent like discovering these things learning about these things I feel like there isn't enough known mm -hmm. and there isn't um people don't admit that there isn't enough known so it's very hard when you're going through a lot of changes and you can't understand what's going on so 
I, I'd like to speak out about it and maybe if people can relate to what I went through or relate to some symptoms and then do their own research, discover new things, I, I'd, I'd like to help in that way. So yeah, that's why I feel mm-hmm. called. That's a very mm-hmm. good drive as well to have. Mm-hmm. I, I'm a firm believer that we should always be questioning. We yes, always remain 100%, curious. 100%. And at the end of the day, listening to our bodies. Totally. So totally with you on that. Megan? Absolutely. I agree with Anna. Um, so basically, I, I have fibromyalgia, as you said, and I'm 20 years old. And I've I've been suffering from fibromyalgia since I was 17. And I've only been diagnosed last year when I was 19. And I had no idea what the word fibromyalgia meant. I've never heard it in my life. I don't know if it's only me. I am sure it's not only me, but (laughs) I think my goal today is to maybe if there's someone who's feeling the same symptoms or maybe wants to learn more about fibromyalgia, maybe spread more awareness about it Mm -hmm. because I think we really need to, you know, up the game. (laughs) I agree. I agree. And Tara? So, um... I mean, it's always an honor for me to be able to at least share not just my own experiences, but the knowledge that I've gained um, throughout the years um, and walking the walk, not just talking the talk as mm-hmm. well, you know, and and um, and yeah, being able to actually sh- teach people and re-educate people on the fact that our body is not fragmented, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. it's all connected and to continue being curious, as you were saying, and finding the why behind the why and and knowing that we're not meant to be struggling mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. the extent we are and to teach people how to actually trust themselves mm-hmm. more, to trust what their body's showing them. So it's why I kind of came to this point in my life of what I do, because it's just, again, teaching other people what we haven't been taught, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, so That's it's so an important. honor. If I can add um, something that helped me discover what I'm going through and what I have is actually like women speaking out about their own experiences so blog posts stuff like that that's literally what got me into it and that's when I was like oh shit okay I think I know what I have and then obviously more research followed more understanding followed but it was these women speaking out that Mm -hmm. really sparked my oh my god it could be that like so that's another reason Mm -hmm. and this same thing was actually mentioned on the second puberty show which was also heavily on women's health Mm -hmm. and the importance of community and finding spaces where you can speak because our experiences are not as isolated as society makes them out to be many times so before we start going into our own experiences i want i want to start with some statistics and one question to follow after so statistics show that more than half 57% of women feel that they have been misdiagnosed simply because of their sex. It takes approximately five years for autoimmune diseases to be correctly identified and diagnosed in women. Female-specific conditions such as endometriosis, fibroids, cysts, often take 10 years or more for actual identification and diagnosis. Women have even been referred to as medical mysteries, simply because much of the research and training that doctors receive on women's health is actually quite outdated. Now, of course, some errors are unavoidable because doctors are humans at the end of the day, and I don't want us to dispute that. that. Exactly. But some have even referred referred to this as an epidemic of misdiagnosed women. So with all this in mind, for you personally today, what is the reality of young women's health in 2023? Hmm. Very interesting. (laughs) I mean, as you said, we can't put all the doctors under one umbrella. Mm -hmm. But um, we spoke a bit before we started the podcast and Mm -hmm. all of us had a bit of an experience. Mm -hmm. And we were misdiagnosed and it took years to actually have a diagnosis. And for me, I had to go on with two years of my life not knowing what I have. And it was a really major issue in my life. It was really affecting my day-to-day life. And I'm sure even for you guys. Mm -hmm. So maybe, yes, I I think we need more education. Not not only the doctors, even young women and even men. Mm -hmm. I mean, fibromyalgia is not a... It's not only in females. So, mm-hmm. um, so yes, I do agree that we. I think we need more education about yeah. our, our issues that we're talking about. And um, I feel like maybe 
the the professionals should should look into it more and maybe give more attention to these issues but yeah. I, I i again i don't want them i don't want to like bash anyone as you mm-hmm. as you sa- said but um it's an actual it's 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 disturbing a day to day life mm-hmm. yeah and the mm-hmm. the patient you're dealing with is living every day yeah. in pain or in or in struggle so yes i think we need to care more about the patient mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so on that do you think that perhaps it could be systematic yes mm. probably i mean from like like what you were saying there's i feel like same i had a similar experience where i was i was diagnosed with different things and with all of them it took a while and it took doctors first being like no you don't have that or um, no relax it's just this or a lot of that type of thing going on and i feel like there's kind of some reluctance to um to maybe think oh this could be different to the norm or this could be different to what i've learned or my patient like may have a point in a sense when it comes to something that's a bit different or something that um I don't know isn't isn't the normal thing or the normal way to treat things. So with my situation with um the endo and the PCOS, I was given um the birth control pill to to tackle it and I don't have great experiences with the birth control pill and after a while I found another doctor who's totally different and she um really keeps up to date with different researches, different studies, different conferences, stuff like that. And I went off the pill and I'm able now to treat it without being on the pill which isn't like it's not done in Malta from what I know it's not really done and then when I told um one of my doctors about it after doing like a routine she um she kind of then negated that I have endometriosis after it being confirmed by like three different doctors and got very kind of defensive like no. I know and it was like what it's if, there's that's why I said there's a lot of like unwillingness to admit that there isn't enough known and it's fine if there isn't anything known we're humans we're learning of course the field is growing you know we're still mm-hmm. we're not perfect and science isn't perfect doctors aren't perfect and i appreciate all of them for everything they do but it would be nice if like we could open our minds a bit more to different scenarios and different ways to treat things mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. i think it is systematic yes If I may add of to that. Of course you may. <laughs> um, it's, um, again, going back to the way that traditional medicine does treat things more on a symptomatic point of mm-hmm. view. Mm-hmm. I don't negate Western medicine because it has such incredible um, purposes for certain things, but there's so much more that comes into addressing the body and understanding the root cause. And in essence, even in my practice, I bring in the laws of polarity, which means even certain opposing um, ends of what could be causing an issue. Let's say you have pain in your hip. It mm-hmm. could be stemming from shoulder. And then that could even be something more spiritually related or more related mm-hmm. to traumas or what have you been carrying on your shoulders all your life, you know? So there's tying in functional medicine, which is what I've learned and practiced over the last six years, but then merging so much of what the soma the greek word for the body is showing us and mm-hmm. so intelligent and you asked that question again about um young girls nowadays you know and in mm-hmm. in this society and i feel that a massive um factor at the moment is also the instant gratification the materialistic mm-hmm. side to things the beauty the need to look a certain way the fitness industry the toxic i would say fitness industry mm-hmm. that i had also come from so there is a lot of conflicting information and it can get overwhelming like yes. i think we all know yes. mm-hmm. how overwhelming it can get where you're like one day coconut oil is good for you and the next mm-hmm. day it's <laughs> cancerous so like yeah. you're like what, what? what you I know do? yeah so yes i i i kind of really do believe that there needs to be more of um rather than these dogmatic approaches and rather than all of these trends because that's mm-hmm. unfortunately what things become a trend mm-hmm. teaching people how to understand their own body because mm-hmm. you have a different one you have a different one you have one me like let's learn how to, to understand our own body language not copy mm-hmm. somebody else's you know so 
Yeah, like mm-hmm. it's systematic, but it's so individual. Like teach people how to very good how, how to understand that mm-hmm. rather than, mm-hmm. you know. So yeah. I want to uh, to take uh, even our our um, listeners a bit more a, a step backwards. What is somatic alignment? What is it? If you had to explain it. So somatic alignment basically as a a process, as a beautiful practice that it is, is where it encompasses different schools of knowledge from Taoist philosophy to somatic dearmoring to the polyvagal theory, which is again talking about fight or flight, the freeze Mm -hmm. response, Mm -hmm. the fawn response, the dorsal, that is the shutdown where most people get nowadays. It's complete shutdown, numb, distraction, the doom scrolling, Mm -hmm. lots of people in that because they're so hyper aroused. So bringing all of those modalities in, merging the etheric field, and as well mechanical energy, so like kinetic energy, your movement and energy within the body, and then bringing the science as a backbone. So it, it encompasses all of that, but then we're bringing that into a session. So that looks like using specific breath work. And for me as a facilitator, being able to read and map your nervous system and see where it's at and what that body has been carrying and and where there are certain blocks in the body. And we begin to de-armor, to remove certain blockages that the body creates whether it's in your pelvic area Mm -hmm. the abdomen where it holds a lot of emotional stress or or certain relationships with the mother where the umbilical cord was cervical again the heart which we all protect we all want love we all want to love (laughs) but we protected the most right like so um it targets a lot of different areas and it changed my life you know and it's why I, i was called to be a practitioner in it because as all of you guys like going through the misdiagnosis going through autoimmune and the struggle and then trying my best using the functional medical approach but there was always a missing element and Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the spiritual world the the connection with something greater is so powerful and you you mentioned something else about um women in particular because women are kind of you, you said something. You, medical word, mysteries. Medical mysteries. Yeah. Thank you. You said medical mysteries. And women are so mysterious in a beautiful way. We carry so much intuitive wisdom. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a sign. Like, unfortunately, they've been so suppressed from their own innate wisdom. Mm-hmm. And that's like, that's powerful, you know. So I I hope that with this conversation, we're going to help them tap into it yeah. again, you know. For sure, for mm-hmm. sure. Well, and we'll... We'll speak a bit more on this in depth later on, but we've been mentioning, okay, the diagnosis is so. <laughs> Anna, yeah. what was your diagnosis like? How was so, it prolonged? So I had a few. Um, I was first diagnosed with IBS when I was, I think, around 16. Um, I would have like episodes of like my stomach would be in so much pain. I'd be curled over for a day. I can't walk. I can't move. And then... Um, I, w- I was having one of those episodes and I had always had stomach issues, but so as I got older, it started to get a bit worse and more common. And the doctor came, he told me, you probably have IBS. No, actually, that's also what he told me, the first doctor. He told me, it's your period. I think it's your oh. period um, and it's like stress related. And I was like, are oh, you goodness. sure it's my period? Because this is really painful. And if it is, it shouldn't be normal, you know? That's like, like putting literally something under the move. carpet, man. Like, literally, yep. literally. And um, so then I went to another doctor a couple of months, possibly even a year later, because it was bad and I, I couldn't anymore. And this guy was a specialist. So I went and he told me, you have IBS. Um, he told me, just relax. And I was like, I'm quite relaxed, but okay, <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> and, um, and then he gave me um, some medication, told me to go on a certain diet. Um, which I tapped in and out of, but it never really like worked that well for me. Um, it's a very intense diet. What was the diet? That the you were FODMAP. Oh, yeah. the low so FODMAP. So a hollow FODMAP. Yeah. You like yeah. avoid certain foods. And to be fair, I did notice that a lot of those high FODMAP foods were triggering for me. So like mm. apples, stuff like that, but not all of them. Um, and also throughout like my whole pubescent life, my period was never regular. Um, and when I was around 18, 19, I started to gain weight and have very like strong food cravings. And, um, I was like mentally a bit like very anxious and stuff like this. Um, and I went to a gynecologist, 
but I didn't tell her any of my symptoms. I just told her, listen, I want to go on the pill because my period is irregular. And she was like, okay. She gave me the pill. She did. Questions asked. No questions asked, really. I think, as in it was a while ago, so I can't remember exactly, but I think she did like routine, like swabs or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, she gave me the pill and I was on my way. And then all of my symptoms, like I lost the weight, my period was regular, but I didn't know that that was because of the pill because I didn't know that I had a hormonal issue. So then with the pill, I was also noticing that I was getting very anxious um, and and more than anxious, very emotional. Like I could cry at like any moment and I could have a breakdown and I wouldn't know why. And I, it was just getting to the point where it was too much. I was also very paranoid. Um, so it was like mentally it wasn't working for me Mm -hmm. and so I went off the pill and I was like oh my god I have a weight lifted off my shoulder it felt amazing but then the PCOS symptoms came back and my period was irregular I started to gain weight and like I struggled with body image issues so for me when I was seeing my body change I I couldn't I, I was stressing it was stressing me out and at this point, you didn't know you had PCOS. No, or I had endometriosis. no idea. Or endometriosis. Can I, I ask had you no a clue. question. Anna? Yeah, man. Like, where were you in that stage in your life? Like, oh. so I was um, at that point. I was actually on Erasmus, so I had oh. went off the pill. I was on Erasmus, and I remember thinking, like, I'm at, at, like, I'm at peace. Like, my mind is really at peace. It was a nice, different stage. But then, like I said, I started to gain the weight, and I realized over Easter, I was. So it was like last year or the year before. So I was like 21, 2021. Um, the time before when I I started to notice the weight gain at around Easter when I had come back to Malta because when I was there, I was very much like in my own world. But then when I, when I came back to like what I'm used to, I saw myself look different and I was like, oh my God, like there's something, you know? And then I had like before I had very intense food cravings and um, I tried to like quell them but because I was trying so hard the only thing on my mind was like food Mm -hmm. and like um, just eating Um, and so it got me in a really hyper fixated state which really took away from the last like month or two of my experience on Erasmus which was an amazing experience but I ended up spending the last like two months month and a half obsessed with like my weight which was it which is trivial and it wasn't even a major change but for me it was a lot I I didn't I wanted to handle it Mm -hmm. and so I started researching because I also like I said my period wasn't regular and I was like it, it started to click for me I was like why and I don't know what it was. It was either a video or something I read, but PCOS came up. I, I came across it. like, And I started reading into it. And I was like, oh my God, I think I may have it. Um, fast forward, I go back to Malta for my sister's wedding, actually. And I had, in, I think it was around May. And I had booked um, an appointment with a gynae. And I told her everything. I told her, listen, I think I have this. Please check. And she confirmed it. And so I went back on the pill. It wasn't ideal, but she told me that's literally the only way. She said, we can start with this and then see other um, other hormonal treatments. And then that, like two, three months later, I got appendicitis and I went to the hospital and um, they found, that I found out that I have endometrial tissue. So I have endometriosis. Um, and that was another like, I had no idea. And then it kind of clicked with the IBS and the pain, the stomach pain. It started to like mend. And I was like, do I really have IBS? Like, was that endometriosis? I'm still, I'm still unsure about that. I still don't know if I do have IBS or if that Mm -hmm. was just, or if that just is. Because the pain, the stomach pain is also really reduced when I was treating the endometriosis. So it's linked. Um, And yeah, so then I had to changed the way I was taking the pill, the birth control pill, and I was taking it like back to back for like three months and then stop for a week and stuff like that. But then the same thing with my brain, I couldn't, I was extremely paranoid. Like I, I had just been in hospital, so I was already a bit paranoid, but I was just paranoid about everything. Like mm-hmm. I wasn't enjoying myself. I was very anxious. I was very emotional. It was affecting my relationships and I, I just wanted to go off it. And I found, oh, I also started to get acne as well. I had switched the pill and I started to get acne and by chance I spoke to a friend of mine whose sister had 
PCOS and acne. And he told me she went to this doctor. She's really good. Initially, when I went, I thought she was a dermatologist, but she's not. And she just had a completely different approach with hormone, hormonal issues. And um, she tested me. She tested me for all of my hormones, like everything. And she realized that I have too high of this certain thing that links with PCOS. And I would, I decided to go off the pill and just treat that. And since then, I've been getting regular periods every month. I haven't gotten... You went to the root. I went, literally, I went to the root. And that's what I wanted yeah. because... Thank you. I, I thought, you know, at some point, if I go off the pill, which is the goal, because at the end of the day, it's I don't want to be taking medication for the rest of my life. Like, what's the mm-hmm. point in that? It's mm-hmm. It has its own risk factors as well. Um, and let's say if I ever want to get pregnant, like endometriosis, PCOS, these things make it difficult to get pregnant. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to get to the root and she really helped me. And it's still a process. I just went off that medication because I had to be on it for a year. And um, I reached that a month ago. So I went off it. So now we'll see. It was very small doses as well, um, which was good. Not many side effects. Um, but like I said, I had a regular period. Like I have had a regular period since I started it and I never did without the pill, like ever. It was always like crazy and that was so, so annoying as well because you never know when you're getting your period. Mm-hmm. It's embarrassing. I got it in some horrible moments. Oh. like, <laughs> and, um, and so now I'm at a point where I'm still learning like about my like if this will help me in the long term Mm -hmm. hopefully it will I'm still learning about I don't know much about my endometriosis I feel like the medication I've been taking for the PCOS has actually helped my endometriosis as well because my stomach hasn't been flaring up but yes that's my like diagnosis story it's a bit long so I'm sorry for talking your ears off (laughs) what was so interesting there to me is the fact that you kind of had to go to the doctor yourself and tell him I think I have this yes and you also experienced something similar. It wasn't a doctor yeah. that told you what you no. have. Mm-hmm. You I kind of to... got to it yourself. So exactly. tell us, Megan. I mean, yours is a very interesting story and I, I, I could relate to it mm-hmm. because I think every woman, I mean, I think every woman that I know goes through a, a bit of a hormonal imbalance in mm-hmm. their life. So that's really interesting. My experience, when I was 17, I started getting these like flare-ups and... It was just so crazy to me. It, I, I, I thought genuinely that I had something super wrong with me because one thought would make my body freeze and just have body wow. aches, and I can't, um, I can't lift my phone or, or or a mug or something small, which which usually is very easy to carry. Obviously, mm-hmm. um, I couldn't explain it. It was getting too much, even if you have plans, and you can't explain to your to your friends or to your to your workmates mm-hmm. or, or you can't tell them listen I just froze mm-hmm. I, I I literally can't move and not giving that a label was getting um sort of impossible to live life normally because if 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 you have a flare-up now I know I can I can be like listen I have this and it's a it's an issue and I I, I, I got triggered for some reason and mm-hmm. I have it but back then it was just like <laughs> I have no idea what's happening, but I'm sick again. So, but yes, um, going back to the diagnosis, I was getting these flare-ups, and um, my doctors. I went to multiple doctors. I think I had about five doctors, oh. yeah. and they all gave me the same medication. To be fair, but no one told me that. Listen, there's this. You might have fibromyalgia. I was just told to sleep and distress and she was told to relax exactly (laughs) Exactly. um they were telling me you have too much on your plate and um, uh, you really need to just slow down and sleep and have this medication and that's what I did but every week I was getting it and every week I was going to the doctor and I was telling them like please just look into it more because I did blood tests and I had nothing and I was just literally begging them I can't live like this. I, I'm getting them every week. And then, as you, as you, as you said, um, I was speaking to a person. I was working with a brand, actually, which, were, which, were, which designed something to raise awareness for fibromyalgia. And I was asked to promote it. And um, I had no idea what fibrom- fibromyalgia meant 
I've never heard about it to that point. And when they were explaining the symptoms to me and the medication, I was I was like, well, I think I might, I literally told them, I think I might have fibromyalgia. And they were like, as if, mm-hmm. as if, they, they questioned it actually. They were like, as if you have fibromyalgia. But then I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go home and research about mm-hmm. this. I did my research and I literally, the next day I went to the doctor and I told him, listen, I think I might have fibromyalgia. So as you as you said, I went to the you doctor to. and told him told him that mm-hmm. this is what I think that I have. And then when we started seeing the symptoms and seeing the patterns, that's when we confirmed that I had fibromyalgia. But yes, I mean it it was it has been quite a journey and my, I think my life changed when I started having the symptoms and my life changed even more when I found out what it was. Did this help? Definitely. Because Mm -hmm. then you can, as you said, um, you can find the root Mm -hmm. and work on it. I was just given medication. I was taking the medication, trying to distress. But that's all. I did my research now and I'm aware of what's happening. So, okay, if something's stressing me out, I need to calm down and, and... because I might get my fibromyalgia Mm -hmm, mm flare-ups. So yes, it definitely helps, 100%. And now I know that not, I mean, the medication helps, I'm not gonna lie, the medication helps. But sometimes when I feel that I'm gonna get a trigger, like, okay, I'm I'm gonna gather my thoughts and I'm I'm gonna meditate, for example. For me, meditation works wonders. Um, You were speaking about, I'm not sure if the word is right, somatic, so yeah. I I think I need to tap into that (laughs) because meditation really helped me. But I couldn't understand why I was doing it because I didn't know it It was fibromyalgia. I I thought it was just stress, you know? I mean, stress is a a factor of triggering the fibromyalgia. But giving it a label to me was understanding who I am, actually, Mm -hmm. and and how I can make it better. Mm -hmm. And I used to get it weekly. It was no joke. It was just like every week I had three days in bed mm-hmm. and I'm a very busy body. So, <laughs> so it was getting really hard for me. And now it's been two months since I got my last um, um, trigger. And I feel that now, because since I know how I can treat it, even when I'm having this little, little <laughs> attack, um, uh, the, the, the period of pain is getting shorter. So yes, I, I mean, being aware of it and knowing what you have you can just like try different things and yeah. read about it and research about it and see what works for you so definitely mm-hmm. it helps i feel mm. like um for me putting a name to it also made me feel like oh i'm not crazy like yes. there's actually yeah. something 100%. going on yeah. i'm not 100%. mad and that's a big big factor um, mm-hmm. many women are actually go- called crazy yes. for for yes. pushing there's and a lot continuing of to say mm-hmm. no, no. yes there yes. is yes, yes. yes. that's, that's there is. something i really struggled with i mean I, I obviously don't expect anyone to understand what we're going through, mm-hmm. but not having a label to it was just like telling them, listen, I, I'm literally, and it's so hard to explain that, listen, my body can't move and, mm-hmm. I, and I'm just feeling so weak and having like, I, I, can't, I literally can't look at my phone because my head feels like it's going to explode. Mm-hmm. And like, the worst is when you explain that <laughs> when you don't look it like we look exactly. fine yeah, and they're like us, but you look healthy. great like okay. you're fine and it's like yeah but inside you just feel like you're dying like yeah, you know literally. so I, I understand that mm-hmm. literally mm. in fact that brings me to you <laughs> <laughs> so you've yeah. had autoimmune diagnosis you've also had diagnosis related to pcos yes there's quite a lot to unpack but <laughs> i'm gonna try like concise it a bit Thank you both, by the way, because at least hearing the both of you, it also, my heart really feels for you and many other women because I know how how much people struggle in silence. Like I really do, I, I understand. And um, and yeah, like there, I do believe when you have a label given to you, you're like, okay, like I'm not okay. I, I can explain this to people now. Like I, it takes a pressure off, mm-hmm. but... I always like kind of encourage not to identify with the label because even when then you 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 look for the solutions you look within that that kind of um I would say avenue instead of 
again, challenging that it could be something else, that it mm-hmm. could be something else that's caused that. And it's what kind of led me down my journey of always being on the quest and hungry to understand more. And um, yeah, like, I mean, I was diagnosed when I was 12 with hypothyroidism and 12, 12. And now knowing what I know now and this, through my spiritual journey, I understood the suppression of speaking my truth that was also intergenerational that came from my mom's side. And there was a lot that was passed on. And again, not something that is spoken of or mm-hmm. it's seen as woo, woo, you know, like it's not something that's considered. But there was that and that I was on medication. That's something I'm still on medication for because it's been such a long time. But symptoms correlated with that, you can have these co um co-illnesses or co-diagnosis that can come from that so I mean I was then later on I went through a very like traumatic childhood in certain aspects and later on in life but I didn't understand the impact that they had Mm -hmm. on my body on my spirit and I kept on going I was very much in this survival mode um, a lot of my life and very driven to like kind of just prove myself and go and I went into bodybuilding and competing and that was kind of my medicine at the time. Little did I know it was an additional stress Mm -hmm. on my body. And then when I moved away from Malta, I started to experience a lot of symptoms. My hair would fall out. I would start losing my vision. I would not be able to like hold things. It would be painful, painful touch, even to brush my hair. I would um, have no energy at all. Like sleeping hours and then waking up and saying how the hell am I gonna face today Mm -hmm. and I was away from home so it was very hard but I I was doing my best to like figure things out whilst I was away and going to hospitals and whatnot and then he told me listen like you really need to go Mm -hmm. back and I also had visible symptoms like on my legs called levita reticularis like so my legs would have this like almost like a web of purple all over them and I was like um okay this Mm -hmm. is not normal you know I could tell my body was speaking to me um again still involved in certain belief patterns and habits and things even chronic dieting and all of that Mm -hmm. which is a perpetual thing that women are under as well which is Mm -hmm. causes additional stress Mm -hmm. all of that that was still going on I came back home went to immunology like an immunologist and went through all of that and I was really struggling put on weight, like didn't recognize myself, trying to still go to the gym as an athlete and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And my body, I was fighting with my body and my body was fighting back. And um, I like broke down and again, being told, you know, oh, it's okay. Like maybe, maybe you just need rest or maybe you just need some time because you were traveling. Like you just, and I'm like, no, no like <laughs> save me the BS, please. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. I just, I know my body, like, you know, your body. Um, and I was then diagnosed with, um, at first was APS, which is, um, oh my God, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, very long, um, APS is <laughs> shorter, um, and fibromyalgia at first. And then I, I was put on immunosuppressants and on morphine at times as well. And it was just a struggle. I was like my hair, everything changed. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you said, like as well, it was how do you explain this to people though? Like you constantly feeling like it's just, when do I have a good day? Like when is going to be a good day, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, it was hard to work, hard to focus, hard to do many things. But along the way I was like, you know what, this isn't going to be my life. Like this is not going to be my life. So I researched and researched and tried different things and implemented them on myself and embodied it. And then I decided I, wanted to take it further. So I enrolled in an institute in America and I, again, whilst learning, I'm like putting everything on myself and being the embodiment of it, you know? So, um, and I started to slowly like heal and put things into remission and to understand, um, but also not negating the fact that your body is a whole and you can't just think oh, it's because of just stress or it's just because I've gone through like a rough period in my life or there are so many things that are connected and we're all our own individuals and just understanding that. And later on, I was diagnosed with PCOS and 
I was just like, oh my God, like one thing after no, another, no, no, no. after another, you know, like seriously. But I understood, I'm like, so clearly my body is speaking to me mm-hmm. in different ways and I haven't been listening. Mm-hmm. And it's where, sure, I did six to seven years in functional health, but the certain patterns, certain embedded things and the way that we think and what was passed on and what's embedded in our tissues it's something we carry with us. And until we're addressing that, even trauma is stored in the lymphatic system. So the, the lymphatic system is not just responsible for clearing toxins and mm-hmm. managing your your fluid, but it's also responsible for progesterone, which is an essential hormone for women that helps them to calm down, that helps them prepare for pregnancy, that mm-hmm. helps them to actually um, break down fats in the body. There's there's so much. And if that's congested because of unresolved trauma and maybe you have poor lifestyle choices that mm-hmm. keep you stagnant, then it's a domino effect, mm-hmm. you know. And I, f- I wish, like at that time, I knew all of that, right? It was never addressed. Mm-hmm. I remember going into a gastroenterologist specialist doc- office and I'm like so like is it okay if I do the lymphatic drainage and he's like what's that uh-huh. and I looked at him I'm like you're joking right <laughs> oh my. Like, okay thanks bye like see you later <laughs> you know so it's just for me if things are not addressed as a whole then mm-hmm. I'm I'm not in for it anymore like it's not it's not how I view things especially in traditional Chinese medicine and mm-hmm. the way mm-hmm. I practice so mm-hmm. Yeah. And fast forward to today, like I'm, I still have like cystic ovaries, but there's something, it's something I manage and Mm -hmm. I've been working on. And the more I work on it, even like Sasha mentioned, like earlier before we recorded certain food intolerances and sensitivities Mm -hmm. and all of these things become way less um, um, prominent because you are clearing and you're clearing old energy. You're clearing that toxicity within the Mm -hmm. body. And you're making space as well, even for the nervous system to learn how to come back to balance. And mm-hmm. yeah, there's there's a lot of things at play, but. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What if you could start your journey over? Start here and start again there. That's how life works in a circular way. We understand the importance of circles and that's why you are at the heart of ours. Find your way to wellness with Browns. Que bella, bonita, somos la señorita. Que checa mi conquista, su candela, ella, ella. experienced we've all experienced this this element of a a diagnosis being prolonged Mm -hmm. or even being misdiagnosed being being told to get on that medication for that thing or being told that you have gas when it could have been other things I mean (laughs) personally in my case if I wasn't misdiagnosed I would still have two ovaries Mm -hmm. it's as hard hitting as that because prolonged misdiagnosis can bring on so many complications Especially in my case, because I had a 33 centimeter ovarian cyst connected to my ovary. There was no way that ovary could be saved yeah. once that cyst had grown to that size. So it's just heartbreaking to see so many other women experiencing it. It's heartbreaking because it's not an isolated incident. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. It's and not. also... The conditioning of, oh, if you have a headache or if you have this, you go to the doctor, you go to the GP, you do this. And it's, there are so many nuanced ways as well, even of the types of functional practitioners, like let that become the new norm Mm -hmm, as well. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also to ease the number, to to kind of take the load of the numbers on the healthcare system, the the traditional healthcare system, to maybe give them more time Mm -hmm, to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. get to the root and to ask certain questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I guess I do understand when they're, there's a large influx of Gosh. patients. I, I understand mm-hmm. that. but yeah. And they're under-resourced. They don't have yes. time. No. 
definitely. You were mentioning that Anna as well in terms of what what you were working in as well and the lack of resources. Oh and- yes, yes. As in, um, with a lot of my work, but I'm, that I'm doing now, I I look into a lot um, about sexual health. Um, and there is a big lack of. So I'm no doctor, so I can't say things like, um, perfect. Um, what's the word? Like officially, I guess. Um, or technically, um, but there is a big lack of resources and a big lack of care. Like there are amazing doctors and amazing people that just want to help mm-hmm. and want to do good. Really? But when there isn't, when they're not given the means to do so, and you, we just have one GU clinic that you have to wait for six months just to get an appointment, it's it's crazy because then then no wonder people don't trust the system or mm-hmm. people feel like, burnt out doctors feel burnt out I can't speak as one I'm not one but um definitely I do think like you said trying these different avenues and maybe releasing a bit of a stressor off the system and normalizing different things normalizing understanding your body yourself as opposed to just going to the doctor and like letting them tell you what you have or tell you what's going on and just um not trying to understand or not being taught about these different things causes a stress to the system because everybody's going for every little thing because no one knows what's mm-hmm. going on. It causes a stress to yourself because you don't know and um, it's hard to learn as well and not many people are willing to teach. So it's very important to normalize different things, normalize education. Like we were talking about it before. I had never heard of PCOS. I had never heard of endometriosis. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that it was abnormal not to have an irregular period. I I thought it was like, I was like, oh no, it's normal for me. I wanted to get on the pill because it was annoying to me, you know, not because I thought it was abnormal. Mm-hmm. Endometriosis had no idea about it. Like I, I, even thinking back to it now, those pains that I must have had and why the doctor probably told me it was my period. It was most likely an endometriosis flare up and that's why I couldn't walk for like, a day or two it's like these things they're they're interconnected and if we're not taught about it if we don't know about it how how are we meant to figure it out how are we meant to solve it so and then it's interesting that as well like we both had the experience of once we learned about it then we were diagnosed so it's like if some of the health practitioners don't even know about it themselves enough to like like let's say my first experience going to the uh, the gynecologist and I told her I don't have regular periods, which isn't normal and which as a gynecologist, as a doctor, you know, it's not normal and you they don't check me. Uh-huh, they, yeah. She didn't check. Like she just said, okay, take the pill. Mm. It's like how, what? like <laughs> there is a lack of this education and a lack of within the general public for sure, which I think would just make life so much easier yeah. if and we're you know taught about these a things. A point I also want to raise as well on this there's a lot of, oh, don't believe the stuff that you see on the internet. Mm. And to a certain extent, I agree with that. Yes. Again, we we'll go back to conflicting information. It's yeah. true. Okay. You should always, like, kind of filter. be mindful and mm-hmm. filter. Discernment, yeah. But in my case, I knew something was wrong with mm-hmm. my body. There's you the innate guys wisdom. all knew something was wrong with your bodies, but you weren't being listened to. No. Mm. And I used to Google, like, when I used to have mm-hmm. the cyst and I didn't know I had a cyst that was literally growing. It had been growing inside of me for two whole years and multiple my doctors God. missed it. I used to Google, you know, abdominal mass mm-hmm. in a woman. Mm-hmm. And the first thing that used to come up for me was always ovarian cyst. And I used to look at it get petrified and say, Ola, as I can't if, possibly like, have that. It, uh-huh. But mm-hmm. it just goes back to how much we need to actually listen to ourselves. Mm-hmm. And when your body oh, is telling you that something is wrong, listen. when those alarm bells are actually going off, we have to listen to it. And that's the intuitive that's really. nature of a woman. And we've been, I mean, I really feel that the education around periods in general from young ages has been that it's a burden mm-hmm. <laughs> instead of giving the education that and it's so stigmatized so it is stigmatized. And, and instead of like teach let's teach girls like how to nurture their cycle and the seasons sense. and how to the seasons that's something i've mm-hmm. been learning about recently as well it's so interesting that like your body needs different things a woman's yes. body needs different things at different phases of her cycle yeah. i had no idea Me when too. it comes to diet when it comes to exercise once you tap into that it's 
I'm trying to get into it. I find it hard to change my like routine weekly, if that makes mm -hmm. sense, diet wise, mm -hmm. um, exercise wise. But they can blend in. So they can know. blend in as well. And, and it I doesn't have, have to be so, so extravagant rigid. either, you know, you totally. can do the little things. Exactly. And I found for me listening to like, let's say when I'm about to get my period, I'm tired. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. I the need to eat certain things. I had the loose. You phase. need more warm food. Yes. Exactly. Your digestion needs more warmth comfort, rather than mm -hmm. rest. And mm -hmm. I, I've come to, I'm at the point where I'm not like, no, I need to go, go, go. When my body is telling me, you need to sleep an extra two hours tonight, I sleep an extra two hours. Like, you have to listen, Brilliant. especially as a woman. Like, our, we have so many hormones, so many mm -hmm. things going on. Our bodies need different things. And it's so important to listen. Like, I've really found that. And then you can actually show up so much better. Yes, 100%. Days. Once you give yourself the rest and you give yourself the... Even the body nourishment, like yes. from from even certain foods and mm -hmm. like when you said your hormone tests, was it estrogen that was um, elevated or testosterone? No, it was. I'm not sure if this is a hormone. I believe it's a hormone, but it's called prolactin. It's, oh, prolactin it's comes okay. from the pituitary gland, yes. I believe. So I had very high prolactin. Otherwise, all of my other hormones were pretty fine. My thyroid hormones are a bit wacky, but uh, <laughs> Interesting. but I don't have any like real symptoms from the thyroid hormones and if i'm not really experiencing any symptoms i'd rather leave it as is i don't want to take anything or do anything mm -hmm. until i like need to um but yes it was my production that was high and then once that came into control like i said the pcos is r managed and so was my endometriosis the prolactin for sure must have been affected well i should not say for sure but it must have been affected by the pill as well because probably. that would affect prolactin probably. levels probably um i don't know like too much about that but my doctor had mentioned it and i believe when they tested my prolactin it was when i was on the pill mm. but then again the pill did also really help my symptoms of pcos like mm -hmm. and the endometriosis it, it helps a lot as though you're pregnant though uh, oh, like so yes. yeah Okay. It, it does give you the like pregnancy glow for a bit. I know like, it did. Oh. It totally did. But not in my I head. I have no like, idea about that. Yeah, some people really feel like good for a bit, but then you do uh -huh. it aesthetically, it's, like I felt very good, but then like mm -hmm. in every other sense, no. For me it's a no and it's different for different women. Like yeah. some women feel fine on it and that's absolutely fine. But for me, um, emotionally it wasn't it and that's why like even this prolactin thing I didn't I didn't know what it is I didn't know it could affect my um, reproductive hormones or my reproductive you know it's like even when you asked me you said was it estrogen or testosterone like there are so many different things you know like and it's not, sure. not fault that you or anything but it's like so individual as well mm -hmm. so individual exactly what you said at the mm -hmm. beginning mm -hmm. so we've heard a lot about how you have managed your symptoms and it's very interesting and i want to hear a bit from you mm -hmm. first of how would you describe living life with fibromyalgia and you mentioned meditation before perhaps you do other things that oh, really? <laughs> kind of keep these flare-ups at bay what is it that works for you as you said, as you said, and as you said, <laughs> as we all said, <laughs> as, we, as you all said, <laughs> it's, said. it's very, um, uh, it's up to the individual. Um, um, but for me, I mean, again, the medication did help, and the medication that I was given were just stress pills, and they were mild stress pills. I feel that my fibromyalgia is not the worst, as in it's a milder kind of. Mm -hmm version of fibro because i know people because then i i spoke to people which had the same experiences there's people which literally just can't get out of it and it's because they didn't have the education and they couldn't under, understand what they were going through and it's just now prolonged to a very long a long period of fibromyalgia flare-ups but for me um the medication helps um meditation which is breath work um visualizing and just connecting with nature and just understanding that you know just understanding your own spiritual being and even your physical being so just realizing that listen you can't always be on the go and you need to just have five minutes or ten minutes for yourself it's basically just that 
um, for me, even music helped. I, I come from a musical background. My life is music. <laughs> um, uh, but yes, I actually even researched about musical therapy. And if I'm being honest, I didn't really believe in it. I used to read about it and I, I, I don't know. It just didn't make sense to me. And there's not a lot of research about it. There's a lot of, it's just sort of a theory rather than a fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then recently this year when I was getting some attacks, I was getting onto the piano and trying to force myself to play and even sing. And even though at the moment, at that point, you're just like, oh my God, my headache is getting worse. After a while, it just feels better instantly. So for maybe at that point, you don't feel it or maybe it gets worse, but then it just, it's, I don't know how, but I, I don't know the science behind it, but you had mentioned something because we spoke about this, but the I had one instant where I was just so surprised. I was telling everyone about it. Like I had a flare up and I went to sing, I went to a rehearsal and I just feel so good now. Oh, good. <laughs> so um, I had like an hour long rehearsal where I, I was just constantly singing without a break. Mm -hmm. And I thought that I was going to just pass out in the rehearsal but then after I left it was just like look at that <laughs> I'm, <fine>. I'm back <laughs> so uh -huh. there's many many um, uh, methods which you can try but the thing with fibromyalgia although research thank god now is 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 getting more is, there's more research about it and people mm. are getting more interested it's still very um understudied I mean there's not enough research and there's not just like one thing you can do to feel better that's why everyone should sort of tap into and try different methods to see what's mm -hmm. what's better for them and I think something else which is really important is not um uh, leaving your 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 methods up until you feel the flare up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have to constantly work on it. Yeah. For me, again, I was getting them weekly now that I'm constantly trying to have my self care at bay and trying to um, realize that, because you mentioned it, not being all, always on a, on a flight mode mm -hmm. or a fight mode, it's just like trying to keep things as, at bay at, as, as possible, you know? So that's, I think, what works for me. Trying to constantly take care of myself and not neglecting it. That's a priority now, it mm -hmm. wasn't before. Can I ask you, did you find it hard to get into meditating? Like, how was it initially? Because I've tried and I, I find it really okay. difficult. I find it really difficult. Again, you need to just, I think, try different methods mm -hmm. of what works for you. Um, the first time I tried it, I'm not going to lie, I was like, this is so stupid. <laughs> it just doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. But there was a moment where I, I searched for guided meditation. Okay. Basically mm -hmm. just on YouTube, like, or, mm -hmm. or, or Spotify. Mm -hmm. But um, I was trying different channels. Mm -hmm. And what worked for me was just being alone in nature. Yes. Like going next to yes. the beach I was and so just connecting with nature. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And would you like, when you do things like that, do you like take distractions like music or a book or something or you just go to like meditate and just be still and like... It's, it's not always the same for uh -huh. me. But um, I I actually start with stretching. I should say yes. that. I start mm -hmm. with stretching. Mm -hmm. And that puts me in a mindset mm -hmm. of, listen, okay, this is my time to ground myself and this is my me time. Mm -hmm. And then I just sit down and put my headphones on and just listen to a guided meditation and follow it. Mm -hmm. I guess everyone's different, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I feel that you should um, try different methods and give yourself the time. Mm -hmm. But what's important is that you mentally prepare yourself of sort of, being let down if that makes okay. sense mm -hmm. so it's like not having high expectations uh -huh. exactly uh -huh. Uh -huh. and then when you find it it's just like okay, okay i found uh -huh. it exactly yeah. okay no i'd really love to try something like 
meditation or like you said just going into nature stretching I love stretching as well I feel like it just releases something Absolutely. it's so relaxing it's like <laughs> there's nothing like it honestly um so uh, I really like to um go into nature switch off not take my phone because I also have a terrible addiction to doom scrolling you mentioned the mm. word doom scrolling before and I was like oh my god I I I am so bad at the moment I just I hate it Can I add <laughs> two things? Um, one is being, I, I don't know if this makes sense and it's going to take a bit of a, a different route, but mm -hmm. just gratitude and just mm -hmm. um, starting your day with gratitude because that's going to put you on a, on a like, on this aura or a mm -hmm. mindset. Mm -hmm. And second, like, I don't know if everyone knows about this trend, but hot girl walks, guys. Yes. <laughs> When you go on walks and just like, You just need time for yourself. And I yes. think that's really important. I, I found it really important to just like give myself time mm -hmm. because I, I had, I just didn't put myself first, if that makes sense. And prior mm -hmm. not prioritizing me was putting my health at a really bad state. Mm -hmm. so I love how we've kind of made a full circle because typically when someone gets some kind of diagnosis, I speak in my case in, 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 uh, in particular here, we would be very disconnected from our bodies and we wouldn't be listening to our bodies. This keeps coming up mm -hmm. during the conversation. And I want to turn to you now. So as someone who has, who is, you faced autoimmune diagnosis, you faced many diagnoses, but you're now a health specialist and a somatic trainer. So how has your personal health journey influenced your professional approach? Oh, insanely. <laughs> like I, I am what I am and I do what I do because of, everything that I've been through and listening and observing um, the both of you again with just taking little um, breadcrumbs from from what I can hear it's all about our nervous system state mm -hmm. it really is and the way that our body um, is continuously responding so our body is literally gauging that seven times per second am I safe am I safe am I safe mm -hmm. seven times per second and it's going to respond in that way. So even you, you mentioned previously, sometimes you get a thought and then you feel your body. So again, I'm going to go back to what there's implicit memory. So what the body stores as a memory and there's explicit. So it's a rational um, kind of recall of a memory, which again, you can maybe recall a memory and think that you've got over it and you're fine now, but the body remembers very differently. Mm -hmm. um, and then you were also mentioning how you you find it hard to go into meditation, right? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes meditation isn't always good for everyone because they would be in this dorsal shutdown state. Mm -hmm. So actually going deeper in stillness is not what the body needs. The okay. body needs gentle movement. It okay. needs some time in nature for sure. Or like you can do certain contemporary movements mm -hmm. since you were a dancer. And so there's so much that you can invite mm -hmm. in terms of signaling to your body, I'm safe, it's okay, grounding, like actually Even if it's pressing your feet with your bare hands and giving yourself a foot massage like mm -hmm. in Ayurveda or you go in nature and you actually like ground yourself. Mm -hmm. That's also very beautiful. Um, I think the one thing I can say about my entire journey and how it's influenced is there's a quote that's always stuck with me, which is when you think you've exhausted all options, remember you haven't. And mm -hmm. it stuck with me because there's always... There's always something, you know, so I kept on and and I I continue to try to understand more. Even in terms of the fibromyalgia, I, I fully understand what that feels like. And I I really feel that I can help people hold pain because I know the pain and so do you. And that's why we're here today. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, this there's always deeper work to do mm -hmm. and it really goes down to our nervous system state when there was this disruption in our lives whether it was from infancy through adolescence and adulthood that literally disrupted the experience that our body was going through in all forms energetically physically mm -hmm. when that disruption happened when it's too overwhelming for the nervous system to handle then that's where the body starts to go into this misalignment mm -hmm. and sometimes people are in that state for years man mm -hmm. like 
in this chronic fight or flight and I see it all the time because certain life demands and if your parents or you know your students studying or anything like I I get it it's it's hard but as you said it's about let's educate on how important all these holistic practices are and how they should be the fundamental of the of the way that we live Mm -hmm. because at the end of the day it's fueling our cup to actually show up in the best ways that we can and it it affects our nervous system it affects the health of our cells and and the way that we're able to communicate and be in that social connection that calm state of our nervous system and it's not staying calm all the time no that's not a healthy state we don't want to always stay in the same state Mm -hmm. the problem is when we get stuck in one state like we're stuck in freeze or we're stuck in fight or flight and that's where like all the symptoms come on because you increase cortisol, the stress hormone, mm-hmm. and adrenaline. and That's something I had really high as well in my high first cortisol. Um, blood test, really high cortisol. And the, I mean, it's also lifestyle, I guess. Lifestyle affects cortisol a lot. 100%. Uh-huh. 100%. Um, and my recent blood works, like re- a month ago or so, it was went down a lot. And that's like, it, made, it makes such a difference. Even I find the way like working out for me, like certain exercises, very high intensity. That's I always feel like my body feels stressed stressed after when it's a lot of Mm -hmm. too stimulating yeah and there are so many women that kind of think like more will be better Mm -hmm. and like even I myself used to train a lot because I was just used to pushing so much but Mm -hmm. my body can't even take that anymore I train weights like twice or three times a week and then Mm -hmm. I do yoga and I do pilates and I movement in different forms it's always balance eh? like Mm -hmm. with everything it's like (laughs) I wish people taught me more what balance meant though yeah Because like it's easy to say, oh, just balance. But I think it's balance means like something on a scale that's equal on both sides. But Mm. I think it's more like learning what works for you in the right doses kind of thing. In the right moments as well, because Uh we need different things at different moments. right? And even if you've gone through a stressful event, so let's say, I don't know, um, you had a really difficult day at work. And you're putting that pressure like, oh my God, I need to go work out and I need to do this. It's like, wait a second. If today your nervous system state is already showing you that you're here, why are you going to add to that? Like Mm -hmm. take a rest, slow it down, Mm -hmm. nourish your body, maybe take some, a nice Epsom salt bath and sit in presence because presence is everything. And then when you come back to balance, you can do that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and not spike your cortisol and get all of those. Because <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. then that's counterproductive to fat yeah. burning. Like you're not even going to get yeah. the results you want. Mm-hmm. You're just going to get the cortisol belly and yeah. the inflammation. inflammation. I know. feel like it's hard though with the way um, like society is structured, I guess, Ooh, in a way. Because when you work, like I've just started working full time and I love my job and I love working, but you realize you spend like most of your life working yeah it's so hard to find that balance and to find that like um energy to do everything you want to do and it's with the way society is structured i guess it makes this very difficult it makes tapping into the self-well-being aspects which is so important because at Mm -hmm. the end of the day we have one life and we should live it you know to the best with the best quality so it's very interesting that the odds are against everyone in a yeah. sense <laughs> yeah and it's quite it's quite amusing in a way how i i recently kind of went into a bit of a, a slower life because mm-hmm. and you've mentioned the nervous system that is something that i've been learning about actively recently because i realized that i've probably been dysregulated in a dysregulated state for most of my life and i was telling you girls before when we were getting our makeup done It's not that I blame myself for what I've been through Mm health-wise, but in some ways I do because I actively chose to keep my body and myself in very high levels of stress. Mm -hmm. But maybe you were miseducated. I don't know. We were, definitely. I never knew about these things. I wish I learned about nervous system regulation when I was in school. Mm -hmm. I wish I learned about meditation. Mm -hmm. I wish I learned about all of these health conditions Mm -hmm. that we might be dealing with in our lives. But we're never told anything about. And even then, when you obtain a diagnosis or when you're close to obtaining one, the level of support is still quite minimal, which Mm -hmm. brings me back into my next question. Like, what changes would you like to see in women's health and the way women's health is actually approached by society 
and medical professionals at large? Like, how can we actually make this better, more holistic even? There's like a, an approach in terms of what we provide as care and support and, and healthcare and making women feel seen, heard and understood because that's at the end of the day what mostly they're lacking Mm -hmm. and giving them the voice because again that's a collective thing where women have not been able to share their their voice and their Mm -hmm. truth Um, and how even anatomically if you see that the larynx it mirrors exactly the same in terms of the cervix and you can see the mirroring and even in the vocal cords and the pelvic floor if you look at them from a certain angle there's a, a mirroring there and it shows the correlation between the constriction around like those areas and so many of the traumas that women are facing in that area in relation to this lack of being heard and mm-hmm. allowing them to speak up and mm-hmm. and acknowledging that. So I think that's a big aspect of allowing. I want to see more of a norm that when when women are struggling there's this directory of like where they can go, like to a mm. practitioner like myself or some other holistic practitioners, like, mm. okay, go to this person, like rather than what they've been taught, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then the second would be um, allowing women to be more in their feminine and honoring mm. yeah. more of their feminine energy. Mm. And you mentioned it before, how society mm. kind of doesn't cater for mm. having a slow life. And yes. that's exactly what our kind of, capitalistic system is pushing uh-huh, upon uh-huh, us it's uh-huh. very masculine it's yes. very go do I feel like mm-hmm. sometimes it feels safer to tap into your masculine side you feel a bit like you'll be taken more seriously or you yeah. you Especially seem more like a, a boss uh-huh it's it's sometimes it feels like a bit like a crutch and then you lose that feminine side and the feminine side is so beautiful like I love it mm. I love feeling sexy I love feeling like a woman but uh-huh, sometimes it's like okay if I want to be taken seriously then I need to you know, so very much, good point. Huh? There's so much intuitive wisdom in women, and and what comes out from there. And I just think it's more again stemming from the patriarchal system, and what's mm-hmm. unfortunately when there hasn't haven't been certain wounds addressed, then it's going to be projected, and then women's values aren't actually honored and uplifted and celebrated. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that most of us really do want to honor those times of our cycle and 100%. feel into the way that we can just be rather than do all the time mm-hmm. you know for sure and you almost have to feel as if you're rebelling against society itself that's just it. to honor your body that's it and sometimes <laughs> it's like when you're even tapping into that it feels like initially it feels like embarrassing i yeah, feel like yeah, like oh yeah. my god like how girly or like you're trying so hard or all of these things it's just so it's so sad like because yeah. It's so beautiful to like everybody is so femininity is different for everyone, I would assume. And I, yeah. I think and Yeah, I, like recently I've 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 just really accepted how sensitive I am. Mm. I used to hate that about me. I used to hate it, but now that I'm embracing it, it's just I don't know, it's like a, a strong suit for me now. Of course. To like understand people and understand 100%. my surroundings. But it was really something which I hated. And if I if I was going to show that I'm sensitive, it was just like embarrassing for me. And <laughs> no, I'm going to not show my sensitive side. Just so. I think that's the most beautiful side. Like emotions are our guiding <laughs> system. <laughs> 100%. It's and shouldn't be taken for granted eh? because it's it's not actually easy to be in touch with your sensitive and emotional side and instead women tend to get bashed for it. Like, mm-hmm. oh, you're too sensitive. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're too emotional. Mm-hmm. Like, I think there's two sides to... Again, we look at people who are not technically working on certain deep wounds or or traumas and they can come off as projections or you can see that people are hypersensitive because there's such an accumulation of this frantic mm-hmm. nervous system and energy. There's that okay. pent up energy that needs to be released. There's So there's both, right? Like I think that once we're, we're doing that work on ourselves, we can really gauge what is true in our essence and what's coming up as opposed to something that might be deeper and that needs to be released, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. Back to your question. Um, I yeah. wanted to have, <laughs> um, what I'd like to see, because obviously like my experience is hormonal uh, mostly, is just more like girls understanding like periods shouldn't be painful. Mm-hmm. Like you shouldn't be dying mm-hmm. on your period. 
they shouldn't be irregular. Learning that yes, while experiences are individuals are individual, um, there are norms and there are abnormalities, and you shouldn't just settle for things because it's your period and because you don't really want to talk about it because you're shy because it's normal. Like every woman goes through it, and it's it's so important to have it all regulated because it affects everything. Like your hormones affect everything. Mm -hmm. So that's something I'd want to see is more education on that, more education like we're saying on on all of these different issues, all of these different mm -hmm. conditions. Um, and I had just um, willingness for doctors to um, to like it when patients do their own research, yeah. like to accept <laughs> it and be like, yes, you know, actually, what was that? What was that yeah. study? Can I see? Maybe it can help me more than no. <laughs> I know, like I know what I know, and that's that. So mm -hmm. I'd that's like what to I'd see like them to see. continue learning more as well. Yes, you know? it should and be. There that, are. That's the field, like mm -hmm. it's an endless yeah. mushek, and there are, and a lot do, and like like I said before, I don't want to bash anyone, but mm -hmm. uh, it would be nice to see a bit of that patient doctor back and forth. Obviously, yeah. they'll know way more than I will ever know, but they would also never know how I'm feeling. Dialogue, hundred percent. So important. Hundred percent. I mean Megan, I want to ask you a bit, <laughs> as someone who is suffering with something which is essentially chronic, yeah. how can we better support women who are dealing with chronic illnesses or health challenges? Well, uh, that's, a, that's a question and a half. But, uh, <laughs> it's um, my job. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think awareness is very important because I've been... I've been just so misunderstood and you get used to it but sometimes it just it just gets so annoying mm -hmm. like telling people and this is something which which I can add on with the feminine energy because some people just tell you you're just exaggerating and you're just um, you know what I mean so you're just Thanks. you're mm -hmm. just I mean come on like Get to work, kind uh -huh. of thing. It's sad that we've all heard these, though. Literally, huh? literally, yeah. and I and I feel that I have a really high pain tolerance, and I really try to push myself. But sometimes it's just you can't. Bear. Like oh, I, have, you're right. I have fever, <laughs> <laughs> or, or I literally can't see the sun because I'll I'll genuinely like my 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 head will feel like it's going to implode any second. So I think. It's just a matter of awareness mm -hmm. and education because I'm sure that even if there's awareness, some people won't even respect it and yeah. won't understand it because, which I mean, I understand because they're not going through it or maybe they've never met someone who's going through it. But I feel that, yes, awareness and just realizing that these things are just not, out, they, we're not doing it out of pity, you know? No. Less judgment no. then. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We're not doing it to just... I mean, I don't want anyone to pity me. I just 100%. want someone to understand that if I'm, if I'm not showing up as my as the best version of myself, or I'm just simply not showing up, it's just because I'm simply not able to. I'm mm -hmm. sick, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's I think mm -hmm. what's what's important with these chronic illnesses and just simply even I I mean I've never had a full time job I'm a self employed so I've never had a full time job but I can imagine how difficult that can be mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. trying to ask for leave or, or trying to ask or even if it happens during work yeah, I can I, I mean I, it's happened mm -hmm. to me during school but I just leave you know because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's like a lecture and I just finish my lecture and leave but mm -hmm. for for working women and just I can I can imagine, you know, so awareness and being able to to tell your boss, listen, I'm just having a a flare up, or I'm having an attack, and them understanding. I'm sure there's people who do, but mm -hmm. 
I'm sure there's people who so don't. don't. Mm. Exactly. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. So awareness is number one key, mm-hmm. and that's what we're doing here, ladies. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well done. <laughs> what would you add to that? <laughs> <laughs> um, like if I could even go back to certain things when it comes to um, chronic illness and all of that, and what I've seen in practice is. Um, there's such a misconception around certain things like parasitic infection and underlying infections that can really lead to symptoms and overlapping symptoms that we see a lot. Um, And it's so much more common than people think. They go like, oh, parasites, like, what do you mean? It's extremely common. It comes from your water system. It comes from pets or outdoors when you're traveling people ancestrally, even in ancient um, tribes, they used to do cleanses three to four times a year with plants and just to help rid the body of certain pathogens. And it's not done, it got drowned out Mm -hmm. now, but yet we have so much more environmental toxins and exposures. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of layers and I would start there as well. Like I even provide protocols that are customized to one's one's constitution and run through certain testing and look at the labs because for example the most common symptoms I see especially in women is low iron Mm. and they're treated for low iron but then mostly it's not looked at as a whole so I would see low ferritin levels and I would see vitamin d being affected I would see high um isenophils and usually that's a big indicator that there is an underlying pathogen but instead they're being treated for just like the same Low thing in a sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they would still have all of that circling mm-hmm. through. And, mm-hmm. and that leads to so many symptoms that people struggle with and um, cellular function. Like if, if they're depleted from their cells, which is their powerhouse of energy, no wonder that they don't feel great. Mm-hmm. So I would definitely say that oh, everyone should be doing a cleanse twice to four times a year, like mm-hmm. a proper cleanse and start there. And how do you propose that a cleanse should be done? Like It's done with specific um, supplementation, like specific herbs that are combined in in tinctures and in different forms that are given and that you take over usually four to eight weeks. Um, mm-hmm. Things we do to bust what are called biofilms, the protective layer. Mm-hmm. Because for most parasites are so smart. Let's say you can run a stool test if you're struggling with your gut and they release an enzyme that dissolves them once once they've been excreted within 48 hours. So it can go undetected in a stool test. That's wow. why the most common thing is like blood work and bioresonance. Like I would use those formats and they can burrow through the nervous system. They usually lay eggs around the full moon. So usually around the full moon is where the, they would, the females would move to another location and, and lay eggs. Wow. And it, it happens. Like you see people having that in their nervous system in different areas. Like I had one client, three different types of parasites. He couldn't get out of bed and slowly started on a protocol. And he's like, okay, I can go to work. I can do this. Oh, wow. <laughs> but he was told by the hospital, like, no, you're fine. Your test came back fine. Yep. You have liver problems and you have this. You need to a sleep apnea machine. But all of those were like not addressing the root. The root. Uh-huh. Yeah. And and I just went straight there. So there's that. And again, that can have a ripple effect on other things. Um, and also if I had to like direct for women as well, men's health is so important. It's yes. the statistics are around like 40% men, 40% women. And then the rest is literally both of you together. But when you're let's say you have a partner and you're even if you're planning to have a family and for kids men's health and the way that they are cleansing themselves is so important because that can actually affect the woman when she's receiving Mm -hmm. like the cervix is literally like a sponge so it's absorbing so much if you're using other things as well that can also affect Mm -hmm. but our womb is really sacred and we're not taught that we're just literally taught so many different approaches of just how to like how, tame how, it like, and shut it down and just like do, do like function yeah. instead of wait how can I nurture and make mm-hmm. sure that I'm I'm taking care because a woman also receives energies and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. past traumas and even certain things from their partner so it's wow. it's passed through like and you could be receiving that and that's really important because a man's pro- like why do they like prostate cancer and a lot of these type of um, situations happen too late because men are also not the type to talk about their problems. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
And they would have symptoms like burning urine and a lot of discolored urine and all of these things, but they don't speak about it. And that like leads to usually co-infections that happen and they go in the prostate. Why? Because there's a lot of cellular new cells and cellular energy. So they go there because that's their nutrients. So both are important. And the woman is the receiver, the man is the giver. Like, But mm -hmm. we play such a, a an important role for each other and it's mm -hmm. time to honor those roles, mm -hmm. you know, like individually. So I, I definitely would add those things like cleansing and taking care of yourself from the inside out is so important mm -hmm. on on every level for sure and when it comes to like the healthcare system for example and the, especially the western health healthcare system which is which dominates um health in malta everywhere everywhere yeah in the west i mean yes um, what do you want to see more of there i really want to see um practitioners integrated into the healthcare system into the hospitals and working alongside the doctors and and so that doctors can pass on those patients and the the coaches and the pra health practitioners can monitor and follow up because the post care is so important we were having this conversation how yeah yeah i mean in my case yes, when i uh -huh. had i had this cyst obviously it had to be removed and with it left also my ovary and afterwards i was not told anything nothing I wasn't told about um, for example the importance of going to a physiotherapist after because of the scar tissue I wasn't told about the effects that I could have even in my in my 30s how I could have an early menopause and so we mentioned important. this before how you should always have find this balance between yourself and the internet and the role that it yes. plays because sometimes the internet is the only thing that's going to tell you the things you need to know mm -hmm. and it's so important and I really love your idea of having practitioners such as yourself integrated within the system because it can also create a support system for these patients Fully. and at the end of the day it's the clients the patient's well-being is the first priority you want mm -hmm. to I mean, because if, if the problem is going to be prolonged, they're just going to have more traffic going to the But then that's the my doctors. issue. <laughs> so like, that's it. It's, it's literally it help yeah. everyone. Like. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like that system perpetuates people coming back because again, it feeds the pharmaceutical industry, mm -hmm. which and is they the think truth. They, I, I like, guess they feel that they cannot get to the, to the kind industry. of, to the kind of route themselves because they don't know about it they don't know themselves enough. That's why the kind of system kind of brings you back to it. Yeah, but because I see it as a form of control. As well. Oh, 100%. Like I really do. The way the birth control pill is administered, like like chewing gum, honestly. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's, it's a serious thing. Literally. Like, it's a real thing. It's something that's going to, like, affect the way you develop it has risks like serious risks it affects your liver it does all these things and it's just given out as a band-aid to to cover so many symptoms mm -hmm. and I do feel like like you said it's a way of control and obviously it's great for the pharmaceutical industry because yeah, lots you of pay money there. Ew, so lots much of money, money so much money back to on birth control I was actually told to get on birth control after the operation again no explanations whatsoever whatsoever they were like you have to protect your other ovary oh. and of course after such a trauma i was like okay, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna go on it sure. and i remember i had tried yaz the first oh, time even i was on yes i spent Same nine day. days on it and I, it gave me suicidal thoughts <gasps> i had oh, gone yeah. on the oh, stop or, yeah. i stopped yeah. and then it was months of like i'm petrified because i don't want to go through what i went through again and these doctors are telling me that the only thing i can do to prevent it is by going on birth control but at the same time, I'm like, mentally, I can't handle this. But then I did end up going on the pill. Mm -hmm. And I was actually on it for two years before I stopped mm -hmm. this year. And just no one told me about other options. No one told me about... The main vibe I get from you is this act of taking control of you over your own health. Mm -hmm. Be your, being your own advocate, you yeah. know. And, and having discernment. I fully... I am a person who branches out... And has so many different people, even in my field, and who I refer to when it comes to physiotherapists and hypnotherapists and different practitioners. That they, everyone has a role. Like it's never one thing. It's no. it wasn't one thing that got you unwell, and it's not going to be one thing that gets you well, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a whole system. Yes. I resonate with that. Yeah. 
Same here. Speaking about the pill, I feel like a lot of doctors and gynies just give you that for no reason. I mean, I had the, went. Some of them have commission over it, huh? Oh, that's so, something that, that's with all of, that's, that's with all illegal. that's with and all water? all medications though like it's it's um Do- doctors would have commission yeah oh, but i thought that was just in the u.s oh damn. <laughs> and what, what, what i was saying because i i had gone to the guy because i had a hormonal imbalance and i felt i felt that i i had an, a hormonal imbalance i wasn't eating i was really sensitive my periods were a pain mm-hmm. and obviously i went to the guy and the minute she, she she heard that I that I feel like I have a hormonal imbalance, and the minute she heard that I was sexually sexually active, she was like pill mm-hmm. instantly. And, and when I told her, like I didn't, I really didn't want the pill. And it's almost I, like being sexually active is like um, something that needs. She to was be. really. She got angry at me. <laughs> she got angry, she got at, angry me at you because she told me you're not like you're young and you're just like. Do you know how easy to is it, it is. To like get pregnant I'm like yes I know obviously so but it's just my choice you know I relate to you I never wanted to be on the pill I never wanted and that's to be exactly on the pill. why I stopped it because you spoke about it as well before you kind of feel as if you're burying your symptoms and you're not mm-hmm. dealing with yourself yeah, sure. and that's it at and it some does point numb you're you. gonna go off it and yeah, that's what that the, the issues are return. gonna come back yeah. so Absolutely. it's like you're either gonna prolong it and ha- deal with the side effects of the pill I had gonna- asked her I was like how is this going how is this going to help me balance my hormones? Like, it doesn't make sense. If anything, I feel like it's going to disrupt them more and just make them more crazy. And just that's what they did. on pause. <laughs> like, from what I see as well, even when it comes to PCOS and being in that survival state, there are all of these elements where the woman is not feeling safe to be fertile. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Simple. And it could be from different reasons. Maybe there was a sexual trauma. There's a lack of trust in men. Maybe you've witnessed your parents... In, in a dynamic and your body is like picking up on that or something's been passed on or again you're in this like work environment or a life that is not serving you and I just think people feel extremely trapped because of what societal conditioning has done you know mm-hmm. like fully but how do you feel Sash now like so after you're stopping the yeah pain. like and so I stopped in February the first month I was like, and and just I want to say I stopped because I was like, all right, I'm at a very good place in my life right now. I'm at the best place that I've been mentally because I have struggled with mental health in the past. So I was like, it's now or never. Every month when I used to, because I used to take um, Mersilon. Mm. That so was I used the second to, one. I went from Yaz yeah. and Mersilon as well. Yaz yeah, and I had Mersilon oh and God. then I stopped. We all had the same, <laughs> even I, when I was 16, 17, on the same Mersilon. Yaz and Mersilon, Mersilon as well. But oh. that like... It was, Yaz was the first one that they suggested to me. Even didn't I, work then and then Mersilon. And Mersilon, how it works, it's, you, you take it for 21 days and you stop for seven for to, to get your period. And when I used to stop to get my period, I used to be like my god man I really don't want to start it again and every month it's like should I just not take it should I just not start it again so that's kind of some context but I I, when I stopped it the first month or two I was like oh all right I'm fine I'm not nothing's nothing wrong is happening but then yeah like adjusting to getting off of it I got acne Mm -hmm. for the first time in my life as a 23 year old I never had acne all my life Same. never I had a really like my puberty in terms of acne was really smooth sailing I was like and when you're 23 then you're like all right Nasib. I'm never gonna have it avoided that you know like. Tipo, aha, but emotionally it was very 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 difficult and it was one of the things that made me realize how I was operating from a dysregulated state mm-hmm. as well because for the most part, before I got off of it, I was just so disconnected from myself, disconnected from my sexual side as well, my feminine side as a woman. Energetically, I felt as if there was literally something blocking me, mm-hmm. you know, there. And I was like, okay, I, I want to remove this. I want to remove this. But uh, the process hasn't been easy. And I think actually two months ago, I just had, uh, it was just so difficult dealing with the emotions and dealing with the mood swings. My periods have become a bit more painful again. Mm. They've become a bit more heavy again as well. Whereas when I was on the pill, they had kind of tamed down a bit. Mm -hmm. And two months ago, I was actually like, you know what? I might just go on it again. No! I know, and I'm not. I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> it's been a journey, we girl. Will. I do that. 
<laughs> like so I can I help like, you. Yeah. Just to like kind of again like give you the support you need through certain foods and maybe supplementation just yeah. to help you like mm-hmm. yeah. In just, fact, then to aid my journey, I, I I bought some supplements. I bought evening primrose and and ginseng because I read that they could help a bit with the process. Um, drinking a lot of water has been a big one for me this year. Like I really took my <laughs> water intake seriously. Mm-hmm. But aha, uh-huh. then when I actually had this thought of like, ma, I think I I'm gonna go back gone. on it again. Then I was like, Sash, like it has been a very difficult process. Mm-hmm. Don't like take mm-hmm. away allow your body process. to adjust as exactly. well. Like exactly. So now it's been like, I don't know, ten months since I stopped it. And finally, it feels like it's settling mm-hmm. down. You know, my my face is kind of calming yeah. down. So yeah, mm-hmm. it's a journey. Babe. You do. I was I was you thinking do. she's glowing. You're glowing. I, I already it's told true. you, but she's absolutely okay. glowing. To be fair, she she put me on <laughs> a this very helpful product, thing. Really I'm good. on different. Uh huh. It's really <laughs> good. Uh, month month one is already passed. I'm like a month and a half in. You have to be careful with it. Though. God bless. God bless. Because I I'm not comfortable with taking medication mm-hmm. as a gen. One of the main reasons why I wanted to stop birth control mm-hmm. was because I wasn't comfortable with me ingesting artificial hormones. No. You know? For how long Same. was it? For how, for how long have you been taking the pill? I had I was on it for two years, like That's a long time. exactly on the dot. So mm-hmm. I felt the mm-hmm. same with ingesting. Um, it got to a point where, like, every time I was taking the pill. I was just going through, like, I was just thinking of getting thrombosis every time I would take <laughs> the pill. Every day, I was like, oh, oh my God. But that's, this like, so like, powerful. Like, even just the thought process and how, like, that's already... I was stressed. Yeah. Like, it's stress. Yeah. Just, it's like, good. immediate it's stress. Yeah. It just didn't feel aligned with me, you know? No. And I felt like I was doing something against my own will, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Because doctors were always like, no, but you have to be on the pill because you only have one ovary. And if the same thing happens to you again... Then you won't be able to have children if Which you is also both ovaries. Like bringing in so much fear. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, like everything's instilled through fear. Like that in the body as a resonance is just disrupting in itself. Mm-hmm. Like what's your body's resonating with? Like mm-hmm. it's so powerful. And I think honestly, there's so many different things that affect our health. And it's environmental, it's what we're putting in our bodies, it's the way we're we're managing stress. And even the relationships, like what mm-hmm. parasitic relationships are there around you as well, and what's what could be lingering that is out of alignment. So that's why integrating the deeper work and addressing your wounds and what's mm-hmm. troubled you, and maybe some things that you don't even realize that could be, which can be again how you grew up or how you've been handling stress and how you've been handling relationships are your biggest teachers, right? Mm-hmm. Like all of those are so important. They give you the information that we need to like navigate and pivot. And mm-hmm. most of the time we're just afraid like yeah. mm-hmm. to, to face certain changes, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. It's scary to to face changes, I find, when you like. Very scary. Mm-hmm. I do suggest though, I know I've told you so many times to go see that doctor I told yeah, you about. I <laughs> <Very really. laughs> we might she as well saves just my life, give honestly. our viewers the name of her. <laughs> <laughs> No, but she ha- she saves me honestly, and she she like she listens to you. She really cares. She gives you time. Like the first gynae I went to, it was like, oh my god, she was trying to get me out of there. That's how it felt. It's it was so feeling. quick. She was late. There were like. 10 other patients that had to go in as well. It was just like, okay, the pill, okay, ciao. And it's, yeah. it's like, I'm paying totally you. This, yeah. like, <laughs> and this is such a life-changing thing. To just literally. It's such a big thing. You can't just yeah. like, like, brush it off. Mushek, yeah. your hormones are you. To me. Like, yeah. They literally dictate the way you think. Like, not dictate, but impact the way you think, mm-hmm. impact the way you look, impact the way you feel. Like, it's so important. Speaking to you for five minutes it's not enough. It doesn't cut it. Mm-hmm. Like so, mm-hmm. I suggest you see her. She's incredible. <laughs> I'm also lucky to have found a gynae who has actually been on this show already. Yes. Um. She she just really takes her time, and obviously, I have kind of accumulated a lot of trauma, especially in that region, which is why I'm so fascinated by what you do. And actually, when I go to my appointment with her, she takes her time with mm-hmm. me. You mentioned mm-hmm. time, and we've mentioned time many times during this this podcast how important it is for someone to take 
that extra time to listen to you, Mm -hmm. to make sure that you feel heard and to give you that support as well. Because at the end of the day, I do believe that we should find support from healthcare professionals. I mean, it's the bare minimum, right? Uh 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 It's so important. Like that's, I really believe that's why we're here, you know, to make you feel seen, heard and understood and, Mm -hmm. and to honor everything that's coming up for you, like mm-hmm. in whatever way, because it's your experience. Like it's literally what you are experiencing. And mm-hmm. the same as trauma, what can be maybe traumatic for me might not be for you and vice versa. Sure. There's a different, Spectrum. what we call a window mm-hmm. of tolerance as well. But it's like none is, that's why I don't believe in the big T, small T trauma. There, There's like these terms that were coined many years ago, but it's evolved because every trauma is just relevant to you. And mm-hmm. Like, it's just, yeah, like, I think, I think people just need more of that. There's too much mm-hmm. of this instant gratification. Mm-hmm. The, I get everything here and now, surface level and mm-hmm. not enough, mm-hmm. like, softness and compassion and yeah, listening. And For sure. I agree. Can I just add back to the pill? Um, I, I don't want to negate, like, how important it is like birth control pills are for many women as well like Mm -hmm. you know it's a contraceptive which is very important it gives a lot of women sexual freedom it's it's it helps a lot of women with their own symptoms of issues so I don't want to like bash it or discourage people from taking it but it's more of a thing of if it doesn't work for you if it hurts you or um you want to read into it a bit, read into it a Do bit. That. You don't exactly. have to, but I want to say that I like totally acknowledge how I important it is to have I that. I strongly disagree. <laughs> yes, it's true. I do strongly disagree. I just think the latest research even and listening to different functional practitioners, um, it's not, there's so many other options mm. now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like it is not good for women. Like okay. it's just not good for them. That's just my opinion and the peers that I follow Mm -hmm. but I just I just don't agree with it and I think it's it shuts down a woman's innate intelligence Mm -hmm. and her innate system and then also again like it has a ripple effect on all the other organs especially Mm -hmm. the liver which metabolizes hormones and so many other things and Mm -hmm. it begins even to diminish your natural production of your hormones so Uh that's what I was told that um the pill it like diminishes these like hormones or these chemicals that your natural hormones create which are like ang- anti-anxiety and antidepressant oh, um, follicular stimulating mm-hmm. hormone your luteinizing hormone so mm-hmm. you're like shutting your natural body down and, mm-hmm. and again I, yeah. I always feel that there are different options and most of the reasons why people are put on the pill nowadays is not even because of birth control per se like mm-hmm. it happens to be given for a lot of other reasons. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I agreed on the level of like follow your gut and if it works for some women, uh-huh. I guess. Like, uh-huh. But I'm totally with you on that as in I would never take the pill again. Mm-hmm. Never. I just think a lot of people don't never. realize that it's going to have those implications yeah, until no, they, they get don't, them. Because they're not told. Because they're not told. But they're and- just, you know, like one of my best friends, I remember she got on the pill. She was put on the pill when she was 15 years old. Oh, that's so I think like that's about the age that I, I, I had started. No, like 16. Yeah. But but there are no mm-hmm. questions asked. You know, no, you, have no. a, you have a literal child in front Literally. of you and you like get on no, birth control. And, and, and even, they're still developing their... Exactly. I know. Mm-hmm. I know even 14. Ta for acne. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For acne. acne. That was always the, yeah. the, the, the go-to. I mean, or I mean, even the Accutane and like all of these Accutane, other things which are uh-huh. so harsh on the yeah. gut as well like you they're so it's, and they're just they're going to solve one thing but it's symptomatically causing, because you're not going to the root and then you're just causing other things mushek. because that's what happens when you don't go to the root the root and i understand there are cases that sometimes you need antibiotics mm-hmm. Th- mm-hmm. which again given out like skittles but <laughs> skittles like, chewing gum <laughs> <laughs> like love it <laughs> they're there's just so much more that can be done. But I understand there are cases, you know, let's mm-hmm. save Sometimes lives. There are I limitations get it. Yes, as well, yes, right? Like fully. Financial limitations. Fully. Time. But I just I just think that there's like looking at everything on a holistic and usually my most used quote in my practice is the problem is never the problem. No, uh-huh. It's always That's something deeper. That's a good can one. I ask you, um, with terms of birth control, which is the most, besides the pill, the most effective like birth control? If it's like people use the coil. Uh, but mm. isn't the coil <laughs> hormonal as well? Also, yes. But, I can't. But so, and some people have reported that um 
it has helped them. I still feel that it alters hormones, hormones. to yeah. a degree. If it's I have a friend uh-huh. which had serious suicidal thoughts because of the... Yeah. Of the Again, boy. yes. And that always is based off of the person's own constitution prior to needing the, their contraceptive mm-hmm. method. Mm-hmm. But I just feel like that assessment has to be done. And to understand that, you have to really dive deep into someone's health history. So mm-hmm. it's it's hard to say like for one individual, but... I think there has to be this whole concept of sitting and listening first. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. my thorough health assessments, like they can take up to two hours sometimes with a with a client. Like I'm going through everything, like, everything, like even from their family, maternal, paternal, mm-hmm. like because mm-hmm. sometimes it's mm-hmm. passed on. What I see passed on a lot is that say if there was anger, mm. and Malta has a lot of collective <laughs> anger, <laughs> it really yeah. does. And like that's usually the liver in traditional Chinese medicine holds anger and resentment. So that can even be passed down generationally. And most of the time we also see things like liver flukes, another type of parasite, and that could also be passed down. Mm -hmm. And if they're not addressed, it can lead to certain mood disorders or different types of things. Like there was an incredible story of my, my teacher in uh, Chinese medicine where she was approached with a boy who had was diagnosed with schizophrenia like schizophrenia I was diagnosed and his parents had hope that like no it can't be and they found her thank god and they found she tested him and they found the parasite in his brain Ooh. oh my god she cle- they cleared that and he he was fine they had to do about like maybe three four cleanses in total but every mm-hmm. time like completely better no symptoms so That's incredible. I really <laughs> loved what you said there. The problem is never, never the problem. problem. And yeah. I think just our look viewers deeper. can reflect Literally. on that. Yeah. As we unfortunately oh, near no. the this end of our on. show. This can <laughs> <we're> like, <laughs> and I think we, this is actually going to be the longest show yet. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah. So I want to ask you all one thing before we close. What advice would you want to give young women who are experiencing similar health issues or just, you know, they're on a quest of finding themselves out, knowing more about themselves and about their health? What is your advice? What is your closing message? Your lasting legacy here, Anna. Um, So, like we said, listen to yourself and only accept help and accept help um, treatment whatever when it feels right like when intuitively you can say okay yes I think that will work obviously it's a process may Mm -hmm. not work it may but always listen to yourself don't let um don't let opinions of others or opinions of professionals um feel like you're a hopeless case because Mm -hmm. you can sort things out you can find ways but keep looking keep searching unfortunately it's hard sometimes but just just keep going. I agree. I agree. Everything Again. I was thinking about, she said, but <laughs> to sort of round it up, um, don't lose hope and mm-hmm. keep working on yourself. I think you should always prioritize yourself because it's going to make you the best version of yourself and it's going to help your health a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, settle when it feels right. So when you're diagnosed... Sometimes it's not gonna feel right, and you're probably right, you know. So when it, when when I heard the symptoms of fibromyalgia, I was like, "This is it. Mm-hmm. This is what I have." So my opinion is just, and my advice is to just do your research and go to go to doctors, obviously, mm-hmm. but um, uh, don't just settle for what they tell you and settle for what, as you said, feels right. Mm-hmm. I agree. And it does get better, guys. So. Yeah. <laughs> it does. So much better. Really beautiful. And um, I like to add on that, I I would say it's um, make sure that you are doing the work to get rid of what isn't yours. Mm-hmm. Because we'll always carry something that isn't ours. So to understand, trust yourself, if, if something doesn't feel right tap into more of the feeling rather than the thinking and you will be given the right guidance Mm -hmm. you will move forward so trust yourself and know that there's always there is support out there Mm -hmm. there are good people out there that can help you 
just ask for guidance and it will come to you. Like mm-hmm. that's, I think, the the message. You had beautiful synchronicities. Like we all had beautiful synchronicities. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I always say like collect the breadcrumbs because they're going to lead you there. And, and mm-hmm. like you said, don't settle. It's keep asking the why behind the why. Be the annoying kid. Yes, the why. be find annoying. The root, yeah. Yeah. That's, find the root. That's, I think that's, that's something which we yeah. just the why, just why. present. Yeah. yeah. And you? Uh-huh. For me? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I agree with all of you. I, I don't normally actually do give <laughs> advice, but why not? Why not? For me, it's to remain curious and to n- always honor your body and always listen to your body first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you feel like something is wrong and you're not getting the answers that you want to hear, keep digging. Keep digging. That's it. You only have one body. Yeah. And literally, we are that sense of perception in the body starts from when we're 20 weeks in utero yeah. that we start absorbing feelings. So yeah. it's a body first mm-hmm. approach that's going to give us all the wisdom that exactly. we need. Exactly. And we have it. So, yeah. Every, all of you have it. <laughs> well, I'm honestly quite sure that the beautiful energy I'm feeling right now <laughs> with all of you can actually be felt off of the screen as well Aww. i would like to say thank you from the bottom of my heart thank for you, coming so on the show the show means a lot us. to me as i've told you it's a full circle yeah. for me from being guest to host mm-hmm. and i'm so grateful to have shared it with all of you thank you so thank, thank you. you thank, thank you. you all thank you, thank you. Thank well you. it's done, been thanks. really beautiful yeah. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> amazing